Hey, good morning. My name is Julian and I'm a technical evangelist with AWS focusing on AI and machine learning. In this talk, I would like to present how artificial intelligence can help with healthcare. Um, this is not a deeply technical talk. This is mostly for healthcare professionals, doctors, and generally everyone who would like to understand how AI can help uh, deliver better healthcare. Uh, having said that, there will be a few technical uh, things in this presentation, uh, and I will share some resources at the end. Um, I'm guessing a lot of you are not really familiar with artificial intelligence. So I would like to start with a quick history of that topic uh, to give you some pointers and maybe define some terms that uh, we keep hearing about and that might not be very clear. So let's go through a few slides explaining where AI can, comes from and what the main uh, techniques are, and then we'll look at how those techniques can be used uh, for healthcare. So the first thing that might surprise you is actually that uh, AI is over 60 years old. We can date the birth of AI to 1956, uh, when uh, a group of researchers led by John McCarthy met uh, at Dartmouth College in, in the US for, um, uh, for a, a summer project, literally. And uh, they, they coined the term artificial intelligence um, and, and tried to define what uh, that could be about. And we'll look at a more uh, formal definition in a, in a minute. Uh, just for the record, John McCarthy is one of the top computer scientists ever and uh, invented tons of things like the Lisp language and he did receive the Turing Award which is the Nobel, uh, the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for computer scientists in 1971. And funny enough, I, I, at about the same time, uh, maybe a few weeks uh, before or a few weeks after that, uh, that summer project, the first movie featuring uh, a robot uh, as a major character called Forbidden Planet, a, a true sci-fi classic, that movie came out. And I would like to believe that uh, those uh, scientists saw the movie and, and that it, it influenced them in a way uh, to, uh, to come up with a definition of uh, artificial intelligence, but I'm afraid this is just uh, wishful thinking. But still, you know, interesting coincidence. And a definition for artificial intelligence, uh, a simple one, is trying to design software applications and, and systems which exhibit human-like behavior. And of course, a lot of this has to deal with uh, human perception like speech, um, computer vision, natural language processing, and, and of course, the ability to, um, uh, to display some sort of reasoning, some sort of intuition, uh, the ability to predict uh, the future uh, by looking at the past. So this is a very broad definition of artificial intelligence. And, and you know, in a nutshell, we're trying to build things that behave like humans in a number of, uh, in a number of uh, capabilities. And of course, everybody loves to uh, try to predict the future. So very quickly, uh, scientists um, you know, thought that, uh, you know, within 10 years, a uh, digital computer will be, uh, will be the, the world's chess champion. And those gentlemen were no uh, uh, beginners. They were no uh, uh, laymen, right? Uh, Mr. Simon and Mr. Newell uh, were in their own, <laughs> in their own uh, uh, time, they were the top computer scientists. They got Turing Awards. Uh, they got Nobel Prizes, etc. So these gentlemen knew what they were talking about, but those predictions turned out to be horribly wrong. Uh, in 1965, they thought within 10 years, machine would be capable of doing anything a human could do. Another top scientist, Marvin Minsky, uh, thought again that uh, within a generation, we would be able to solve all kinds of problems with artificial intelligence. And even going as far as saying that, you know, let's say by, by the end of the 70s, uh, we could build uh, a computer with the uh, general intelligence of an average human being. So whatever that means uh, you know, is up uh, <laughs> for, for debate. I suppose some human beings are smarter than, than others, but you know, we're, no one ever came near 
uh, that level of intelligence. No system ever came near to that in the late 70s. So lots of completely incorrect predictions by a group of extremely bright people. And fast forwarding to 2001, Marvin Minsky, uh, again, one of those top scientists, uh, wrote an article saying, it's 2001, where is Hal? And uh, you remember Hal as the, uh, uh, the murderous uh, computer, the murderous artificial intelligence in uh, Stanley Kubrick's movie, 2001, A Space Odyssey. And funny enough, uh, Marvin Minsky actually helped uh, how you help Kubrick uh, during the, the making of that movie? He helped him design what uh, Hal would look like. So it's funny that, uh, you know, 20 or so years later, uh, Marvin Minsky was frustrated that um, whatever um, Kubrick designed, whatever Kubrick filmed um, earlier was still not available in real life. And uh, in his article, he says something that's really striking. He says, no program today can distinguish a dog from a cat or recognize objects in typical rooms or answer questions that four-year-olds can. And it, this is referred to as the common sense issue, right? <clears throat> Things that are extremely simple for even young children to perform were extremely, well, difficult, even impossible for any computer systems. So you know, almost 50 years, you know, 45 years after the, uh, the inception of artificial intelligence, uh, researchers were extremely frustrated by the, the state of affairs and they felt they, they were nowhere near delivering the, the promise of building those uh, smart uh, human-like systems. Uh, in parallel, uh, a, a subdomain of artificial intelligence gained popularity. It's called machine learning. So, AI is a very, very wide um, science, and machine learning is one of the subdomains in there, the subfields. And it's fair to say it's probably the the most popular one. And you know, in this, in the 80s and in the 90s, uh, in the early 2000s, machine learning um, became um, increasingly popular uh, in order to teach uh, systems how to learn behaviors without being programmed. So, uh, you know, a lot of you listening to this are not uh, IT professionals uh, and that's perfectly okay. So when you write software, you explicitly tell uh, the computer what to do. You write in, in uh, instructions in a programming language and these are completely defined, completely explicit. And, you know, unless bugs make things uh, a little more interesting, the computer is supposed to do exactly what it's told. Okay, so if it's taught, if it's told to uh, sort uh, text or if it's taught to uh, insert uh, data in a database, that's what it's going to do, right? So you fully explicitly define what the computer should do. With machine learning, things are different. With machine learning, you use machine learning algorithms, uh, statistical algorithms most of the time that you apply to a data set. Okay, and that data set could be literally anything. It could be uh, information on your, on your patients. It could be uh, any kind of data that you want to learn behaviors from. You, maybe you're trying to predict uh, if a, a certain patient will develop a certain condition within six months, uh, you know, and you would do that by looking at in medical exams, blood tests, etc. That would be your data set. And of course, if there's a certain pattern in that data, a, a, a machine learning algorithm would pick it up and it would be able to apply it to, to new data. So that's, in a nutshell, this is what machine learning is about. You take standard algorithm, mostly statistical algorithms, you look at existing data, you try to learn behaviors from that data, and then you try to apply that behavior to new data in order to predict the future, so to speak. Um, but in, 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 that, in that time, in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, um, the, the, the companies that were really leading the charge on machine learning were um, the big uh, web companies, right? And those names are all, uh, all familiar, I, uh, I suppose. And the, the reason why all those companies started investing heavily in, in uh, data processing and, and machine learning was because they had uh, very early on, you know, they grew very fast. They had tons of users, tons of data. Um, they could buy 
lots of uh, of computers you know commodity hardware so lots of smaller systems um, that they would run in clusters to make them even more powerful they are very good engineers and of course those are private businesses and and they had to make money right to keep growing and to keep uh, um, uh, developing their their business so the way I put it, it was really gasoline waiting for a match. There was so much data uh, that traditional systems, traditional databases, um, traditional IT solutions could not uh, work at that scale. It could not work for those uh, hyper growth companies. So something had to happen. And in at the end of 2004, uh, Google published um, a really important paper um, uh, explaining uh, the map reduce architecture so not going to go into details because again this is not a, a technical talk but let's let's stick at uh, the fact that this is really a, a, a new architecture on processing data at very large scale so for those companies it was mostly about web traffic uh, user interaction with the with their websites their mobile apps etc and they needed to extract information from that mostly for advertising purposes. Um, and uh, a few months later, uh, about a year and a half later, uh, Yahoo actually implemented uh, the architecture described in Google's paper and open sourced it. So they made it available to the, to the technical community, to all the developers out there. And, you know, this really caught like wildfire. And before, you know, before you knew it, uh, every company was trying to uh, to process their own data using um, those architectures and those uh, open source solutions. So that was really the um, the the renaissance or the you know the, um, the I don't know the new beginning in a really that um, data processing uh, needed and and of course this was the first step in uh, in applying machine learning on huge data sets. So it's interesting to see, it, it really didn't come from the, from the research angle in a way. Um, some of the research was stalled for decades, waiting for something to happen, waiting for commodity hardware, waiting for uh, uh, lots of data to be available, waiting for open source tools, I suppose. And this all came together in the mid 2000s. And it came together because those web companies uh, built the infrastructure and, and the technology to make it run. And then machine learning kind of you know, moved on to the next step at very high scale. So a few years later, um, you know, let's say in the, uh, two, in the 2000 and years 2010 and later, machine learning is everywhere. Okay, all the, all the web companies, all, all the software vendors, implement machine learning in, in some form, but HAL is still nowhere to be seen. So we got extremely good at processing data at scale, but we could not build artificial intelligence systems in the original uh, sense of the word. And the reason for that is because traditional machine learning, statistical machine learning does not work well on unstructured data. And unstructured data means if anything that doesn't fit in a database, right? Anything that doesn't fit in columns, in, a, in, a, in an Excel sheet, so to speak, right? Um, so images, video, speech, uh, freeform text, etc. All these are um, highly complex data uh, that are just, you know, uh, a, a blob of data. There is no visible structure in there uh, like you would have, again, in you know, medical exams or patient reports. You know things that are neatly organized and that you can put in columns and, and look at here it's just a big blob of data and and machine learning doesn't work with that and uh, this is really frustrating because you know identifying objects and images or understanding speech or translating speech are things that are pretty easy for people to do um, but they are very difficult for computers to to get right and the reason for that is because it's it, next to impossible to describe those tasks formally, right? You cannot formally define how to identify specific things in an image or how to formally understand words uh, in, a, in a sentence. It's just, it's just not possible. So it doesn't fit uh, the computer's mindset, right? So the big question is, how do you fit informal knowledge into a computer? How do you help 
a computer extracts structure, understands structure and extract patterns from something that's just a big blob of data, right? And statistical algorithms don't work here. And the the the, the next step of that revolution was the, again the resurrection of neural networks, a technology that had been around uh, since the late 40s actually, um, so, somehow predating artificial intelligence. Um, and those neural networks uh, were applied to um, uh, to machine learning, and this gave birth to a new subdomain of uh, machine learning called deep learning. Okay, and so deep learning is really a subset of machine learning that focuses on the same thing: teaching machines to learn uh, from data, right, without being explicitly programmed. But this time, those neural networks have the capability to understand data that is unstructured, to understand data where features, where um, uh, patterns are hidden or cannot be explicitly expressed. Okay, so things like images, things like uh, speech, uh, freeform text. Uh, now, using deep learning, uh, we can extract patterns from there. Okay, and I won't go into the specifics of deep learning, but the reason why it's called deep learning is because we tend to build layers okay, of neurons, of artificial neurons, and we uh, stack them up in a way, uh, like pancakes, okay, passing data from one layer to the next. And state-of-the-art networks can have hundreds of layers. Okay? And this is why it's called deep learning, because we will learn uh, gradually by passing data through those neural layers. And again, there could be a huge number of those. Okay, so. That's, uh, I would say, a short introduction of, of our artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. So the key things to remember are um, those technologies have been around for a long time. Um, they've been somewhat successful in the early decades. But what really, really made them relevant is um, the ability to scale, the ability to process vast amounts of data uh, on, on cheap hardware using open source tools and, um, and, and also um, using these days uh, deep learning to understand complex data that uh, relate to, again, vision, speech, uh, uh, natural language processing, things that are key to what uh, 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 being a human means, right? And again, the ability to process that makes the system closer to what humans are. That's the key, right? Processing and structured data uh, is what humans do best. And, uh, and so deep learning is really a key technology there. So let's look at some applications of uh, deep learning for uh, healthcare. Uh, the first one, I suppose, if we look at things in order, is how do you find a doctor? And this this is a use case that I really like. It's a it's a U.S. company called Zogdoc, and they have the simplest ID, right? Um, take a picture of your uh, of your uh, health insurance card. Okay, I, I'm you know lots of countries have this, um, and extract information from that card. So you know your name and your uh, your patient ID and your location and all kinds of information. And based on this, uh, it's going to find a doctor in your area, um, able to see you as soon as possible and uh, optimizing cost in the process. So some, some a doctor that is actually part, that has a, some kind of agreement with, uh, with your insurance company. And as you probably know, uh, the healthcare system in the US is, is kind of complicated, fragmented, expensive. So there are so many combinations. So that, that app, just by performing uh, image recognition and text recognition on your uh, uh, insurance card, can, can find that doctor near you. And uh, the guy can see you quickly and hopefully that's not too expensive, right? So the simplest idea, but I think this is, this is brilliant. Uh, and this is based on, uh, on deep learning for uh, you know text uh, recognition and to extract all that information and uh, as you probably know I'm based in France and we have those uh, we have similar insurance cards and I'm just waiting for 
somebody to import that ID. So if someone's listening, right, I, uh, please build the same thing in France, right? This is so much better uh, than uh, you know having to call 20 doctors to uh, try to get that uh, that uh, appointment really quickly. So super simple. Um, I guess the next step, once you uh, uh, actually uh, met the doctor and uh, and the doctor has a has a report, would be to uh, try to apply some kind of processing to uh, to your uh, uh, to your exam. So this is actually a service that uh, Amazon released, AWS released just a few weeks ago. It's called Amazon Comprehend Medical, and this uh, service is able to extract complex information from medical report. So let, let's actually go through a quick demo. So I'm switching here to uh, to the AWS console and uh, this is the uh, the web application that lets you access AWS services. So it's super simple here. Uh, we have some text, right? Uh, and uh, And it's fair to say it is difficult to understand. Doctors tend to write uh, using their own uh, jargon and their own uh, abbreviations. Uh, well, I guess uh, software engineers are <laughs> just as bad as the, as doctors are at writing things that are easy to understand. So you know, uh, it's it's <laughs> it's fair to say we're we're doing pretty bad on both sides. But here it's it's uh, medical it's medical information. So. You know the patient is a 40 year old mother a software engineer and uh and blah 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 and okay if you're a doctor all of this makes sense and if you're not uh, all those these abbreviations and uh, are, are kind of weird so um, the only thing that it takes really is to call an api hosted in the aws cloud okay and uh, in real time i get an analysis of this report so the first thing that we see is what we call entity extraction so that's uh, software engineer jargon to say that we are able to uh, figure out uh, pretty much what every word is. So, you know, 40 Y O. Okay, that's the age, obviously, and that's the profession. Uh, so this is personal information. Sleeping trouble is um, is a symptom. Okay, so uh, this is the, the name of a. This is a diagnosis, right? D X is a, is the abbreviation of uh, diagnosis. And so this is a symptom. Here's another one, rash, you know, rash on the face. So face is obviously uh, related to human anatomy, just like leg is. So as you can see, we can pick up all those words. We know exactly what they are. We can figure out the name of the medicines. Uh, and more importantly, uh, we can relate uh, dosage, frequency, et cetera, to, that, uh, to a specific medication. So for that medication here, we see the dosage is 50 milligrams at breakfast, so once a day, and PO means it needs to be ingested uh, orally. Okay, and that's one of those crazy abbreviations that doctors use. Um, you can see the same for this other medication, right? Uh, again, picking up perfectly all the information here and when it comes to you know examinations and symptoms and signs, as you can see, we figure out uh, diagnosis. Um, we actually link this to uh, to uh, organs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So this is really important because um, using this, you could um, you could update the patient uh, the patient's medical report in a database somewhere, so that whenever the next doctor sees the patient uh, they have exactly the information if you're you know two weeks later you want to know exactly what uh, medication that patient got and uh, what dosage etc you have all this information in a structured way available in a database somewhere um, and this is much better than going through a pile of paper uh, looking at you know, exams and, and you know, things get lost and things get uh, um, uh, you know, messed up, etc. So, you know, here, no, nothing like that. Just extract the information, uh, write it in a, in a database, in a system somewhere, and then, um, you know, nurse, nurses and doctors can, can access, it, access it and search it and, and find it whenever they need to. So this is an example, again, of using um, deep learning and artificial intelligence to, uh, to improve healthcare. Pretty, uh, pretty cool service. 
Uh, and of course, a lot of uh, a lot of um, medical exams require um, uh, imagery, right? It's it's really uh, it's really what doctors do a lot of the time. And and well, no surprise, um, a, a lot of deep learning applications focus on uh, on uh, processing those images. So this is an example from a French startup called AZMed. Uh, check them out. A really, really promising startup in Paris. And, uh, and those guys build um, an automated system to detect uh, fractures, right? So um, it's, it's pretty clever. If you look on the right, um, that non-displaced scaphoid fracture, you know, hopefully I got that right, uh, I'm told is a very, very difficult uh, fracture to detect. Uh, it is, you know, if, uh, you know, I'm not a doctor, obviously, but if I look at this, uh, this X-ray, uh, you know, I see nothing wrong. So again, I'm not a doctor, but um, it, you know, probably a doctor could could, could miss that one. Uh, it, it's it's really not obvious that that something's wrong, and of course, all the radiologists listening to this would say, "Come on, this is fully obvious. You know what? You don't know what you're what you're talking about." So no, I don't know what I'm talking about, but the point is, uh, this picks up uh, really really uh, tricky uh, fractures, and not only does it pick. Uh, those fractures up it's also able to uh, build automatic reporting uh, so telling you you know actually what this is and and, and in human readable text uh, giving you information on on what this fracture is and of course this is based on image analysis and and deep learning etc um, and it, it's a, it, it's a pretty cool system so you know again check them out um, here's another example. So this is an American company called Arteris, and they build a variety of apps. And then the, the, this specific one focuses on uh, something called auto contouring. Um, and again, um, this is a super important thing uh, when you're running um, uh, MRI and, 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 and CT scans, etc. You want to be able to find the exact contour of a specific organ. Uh, you want to know exactly which, you know, what is what, so to speak. And, um, and up until recently, doctors had to do this or technicians had to do this uh, manually. So they actually had to go through that, that video from the exam and highlight specific area, areas you know, highlighting specific organs, specific parts of the human body. And this could take up to an hour. Uh, now, using this uh, deep learning technique, arteries can do this uh, on, on the heart, uh, but they can do this for other organs as well. They can do it in 15 to 20 seconds. So imagine you have a patient in the emergency room, um, you know, saving, literally saving 45 minutes to an hour, I, I, you know, I suppose can make a huge difference. In, uh, in taking the right decision and, and potentially in saving the, the patient's life. So those systems are, are a huge, huge uh, improvement for doctors and patients. Again, this is just one of the things that Arteries builds. They have more apps uh, doing similar uh, impressive things. So again, I suggest you check them out. Uh, this is a very recent uh, example. Uh, so I have to say these are uh, you know, as far as I know, this is not running on AWS, unlike the, the previous examples. Um, but I felt this was uh, very interesting to, to mention. So this is a project from the University of California, San Francisco and Berkeley. And this literally came out uh, maybe a week ago or something. And by analyzing uh, brain scans, uh, they, they built a, a system that can detect pretty much flawlessly um, that a patient is going to develop Alzheimer's disease um, more than six years uh, before the actual diagnosis. Yeah, uh, imagine that. So by looking at scans, you can predict that uh, this, this patient will actually develop the disease in a number of years, right? Up to six years. So again, I'm not a specialist, but I can imagine if you have this information two years, three years, four years before, um, there are steps that you can take, and uh, you know, even though we don't have a cure for this uh, this ugly disease, I'm sure at some point we will, and uh, or we can find ways to uh, to improve patients' conditions. 
So having this early warning years before surely is going to make a difference in, uh, in helping and hopefully uh, uh, curing patients. So this is really a, 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 fantastic, a fantastic example. Um, and there are plenty more examples like this uh, for you know, heart conditions and skin conditions, etc. Uh, deep learning is extremely, extremely good at, uh, at detecting problems by looking at complex images um, and doing that f faster and as accurately as human doctors and sometimes even more accurately. And well, um, these are interesting examples, but I'm sure a lot of you think, oh, uh, yeah, okay, that's nice, but AI will never, never replace doctors. And, you know, I hear that a lot. AI will never replace, insert job name here. And sorry if this sounds a little bit provocative, but, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I'm sure, uh, you know, decades ago, people thought, oh, cars are never going to replace coaches and, uh, and, uh, and nuclear energy is never going to replace coal and, and X is never going to replace Y. I hear that all the time, and I think, you know, I, I'm sure I'm using that as, as well for other, for other things. So I think we have to look further than this. Um, this is, in my opinion, this is the, really the wrong debate, because 5.8 billion people on our planet do not have access to an expert physician, okay? Read that number again, 5.8. So looking at this, um, I'm thinking, it, it, is that the right question to ask? Is there a question, will AI replace doctors? I don't think it is. I think the question is, how can AI um, replace doctors in areas where doctors are not available, right? So it's not about replacement, really. It's about extending the, um, you know, uh, projecting um, medical capabilities in areas where they are hardly available, sometimes not available at all. Uh, here's an example, I know, cervical cancer, what, a, what a, another ugly thing. It kills um, 270,000 women every year, okay? Uh, that's that's a, a, an awful number. Uh, and a lot of that is caused by um, um, poor detection, right? Uh, poor prevention. And you could think, okay, yeah, this is probably for, you know, uh, the, the, the poorer countries, the, you know, the, 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 the underdeveloped countries. And, and I mean no offense by, by, by this word. That's just my word for it. But this is actually wrong. If you look at, the, at this map of the, of the U.S., um, the red, this is the map of U.S. counties. And the red counties uh, are uh, counties where um, there is no... Um, no member of the uh, of the American uh, Organization for uh, um, uh, Obstetricians and Gynecologists, right? So look at this: uh, a whole a whole lot uh, actually of counties uh, do not have uh, do not have obstetricians and gynecologists. Okay, so um, that's that's an amazing statistic. I think I was I was really surprised to see this. So. Obviously, this makes it very difficult for uh, for all women to get proper uh, exams and, and, and proper prevention. Um, so this company called Mobile ODT, um, it's an Israeli startup uh, using AWS. They built um, they built a device that let um, uh, healthcare professionals perform uh, exams uh, just with a smartphone. Okay. And obviously, this is a very lightweight device. This is a very inexpensive device compared to uh, compared to the the big equipment that uh, uh, you know uh, OB gene and, uh, and, uh, and and hospitals would typically have. And it, it, it can be deployed anywhere. Uh, this is a, a picture, a, an actual picture take, taken in uh, in an African country uh, where you can perform uh, you can perform exams. Uh, quickly, inexpensively, without any kind of complex hardware and without any uh, uh, medical expertise, right? You could train a nurse, you could train uh, someone to just perform the exam right. And then the app sending results to the cloud can
can actually perform uh, the uh, the expert analysis on does this person uh, have uh, cervical cancer or, or are there early symptoms of that? Okay, and this is a huge boost because now just train the local workforce um, and they can run um, all of the exams in the most remote locations and this definitely saves lives. Okay, and there's, a, there's a really good uh, article, uh, you can see the URL here, explaining how, uh, how mobile OGT deploys this uh, in, in very remote areas. So this is a good example. So you could say, oh, it's replacing doctors, except, well, it's actually replacing doctors in areas where doctors are not available. So is that really replacing? I don't think so. Uh, another example is, um, what about people who need constant supervision? Um, one children in 59, so almost 2% of US children suffer from autism. And almost 50 million people in the world have Alzheimer's disease. And, and, and we know in both, in both cases, uh, patients need a lot of supervision. They need a lot of, uh, of uh, human assistance. And it's probably not available, right? It's probably not possible to, uh, to have a nurse or, or a doctor helping those patients 24 seven. Surely it's not possible. So, you know, it, it ends up being families trying to deal with this and, and we know it's very difficult. So here's an example. Um, this is actually um, this is actually an AWS employee. Uh, it's uh, Troy, uh, uh, great guy. I've met him, and uh, and Troy um, has a son called Calvin, and uh, Calvin has uh, suffers from autism, and and using a number of AWS services uh, for speech to text and uh, and uh, natural language processing and chatbots, etc. Uh, Troy has built a system that lets uh, his kid uh, interact with uh, 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 with uh, a chatbot, really, okay, a voice-based chatbot. So uh, you can look at that video on YouTube. It, it's a little too long to play here, uh, but Troy explains how he built the system, how it helps uh, his son getting uh, get instructions during the day. You know, simple things. You know, brush your teeth or or uh, you know, come come for dinner or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, and by by interacting with the system, uh, uh, Troy's son uh, actually uh, communicates better. So it's it's one of those crazy things. You would think that you know there's nothing that replaces human interaction, but human interaction can actually be very stressful uh, for autism patients. And as it turns out, um, um, the interaction with the chatbot, with the voice chatbot, works very well for uh, for Troy's son. So it's a way to you know communicate with him better. It's a way maybe to uh, um, uh, give him you know uh, advice or or some kind of supervision uh, without actually being physically present. Okay, so. Uh, uh, that, that's a, that's an interesting approach, I think. So it's probably not going to work for all patients, but this is an interesting example. And again, uh, I would really, really encourage you to look at this video. Uh, we can see uh, uh, Troy and, and his son interacting with the system, and uh, it, it's fascinating, I think. So I guess th this could be extended to um, any patient that needs help 24/7, uh, and we'll again we'll know we know it's a bit impossible to have humans in the room 24 seven. So providing assistance, providing guidance, you know, uh, making sure medication is taken properly, et cetera, et cetera. All of this can be done uh, efficiently and, uh, and, 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 uh, and in a friendly way uh, using chatbot. So again, look at this video. I don't think you've ever seen anything like it and well done to, to Troy again for building this. So, I, I truly believe that AI is a revolution for uh, healthcare professionals. Um, it, it allows them to perform earlier detection. Uh, think about that mobile ODT app uh, detecting uh, cervical cancer literally anywhere on the globe as far as, uh, as long as you have the device, as long as you have some kind of network connectivity uh, and, 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 uh, and a trained person to, to deliver the exam. Uh, they, 
AI also helps doctors um, improve diagnosis, deliver faster, more accurate diagnosis. You know, nothing's going to replace the human eye. Nothing's going to replace a, a doctor that has been trained for 20, 30, 40 years. But if you need confirmation, if you need a second opinion, uh, you can get it in seconds from, uh, from an AI system. Okay, look, think about the fracture example. Um, I think about that uh, contouring system from uh, arteries, right? You save literally almost an hour uh, in, in, in understanding what that exam is and, and where to look at and, and what the condition could be, etc. Then, you know, you, you get to better decision faster. That's my point. And then based on this, of course, you can also decide what the optimal treatment is. And it could be personalized because if you have a database of you know hundreds thousands of patients that have been uh, that have gone through the system then you know that you could apply uh, artificial intelligence on recommending the best course of actions right what medication what dosage what surg surgical procedure okay again learning from that data set of historical patients can help you figure out what the best option is for um, for the next patient and again this is going to be a mix of the, the final decision will be a mix of your own human experience and whatever the system tells you. But it's like a constant friend, a constant second opinion that you get based on, you know, a very large set of patients, you know. So uh, I guess that's helpful. And, and generally, I think there's, there's lots of room uh, for improvement on, you know, saving time and paperwork and, and unnecessary exams by just, uh, automating document processing, automating a whole lot of uh, procedures, and and making sure you 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 always take the right action, and uh, and that's always in the interests uh, in the interest of the patient. So by doing all of this, uh, I think healthcare professionals can focus on the most important things, and obviously it is humans, right? This is why uh, doctors became doctors in the first place. They became doctors to help. Uh, um, mankind, right? To, to <laughs> from birth to death, um, to make sure you know we live a, a healthy, happy life, and that's what doctors are about, right? Um, and and no artificial intelligence system is ever ever going to replace uh, human empathy and and human touch, even in the most difficult uh, situations. So. My opinion is this is what doctors should focus on: spend more time with patients, explain, uh, explain options, uh, guide us through uh, the best resolution for um, for whatever problem we have, and when there is no resolution, then just be there for us until the end. And again, no AI is going to do that. So a few more resources to uh, to learn more. So uh, if you're curious about uh, additional case studies. Uh, we have plenty more. We have a lot of uh, healthcare and life sciences companies running on AWS. So uh, please take a look at this page. If you're if you're um, curious on how you could start using those technologies, uh, either directly or working with partners, etc., uh, I would suggest uh, you contact us directly through the website, and uh, and an AWS uh, representative will get back to you and and understand what your uh, requirements are and point you in the right direction. If you are a more technical person, so if you actually are working in IT and, uh, and you would like to start uh, experimenting with uh, some of those services, uh, these are the right places to, uh, to look at so getting started with AWS if you've never worked with it. And, uh, and of course, uh, looking at our machine learning and deep learning services uh, yeah, would, be, would be interesting. But I have to say those last two URLs are really for uh, IT, IT people, the first two are, are for everybody. Okay, so please get in touch. Please let us know how we can help uh, and, um, and we'll get back to you. Thank you very much. This is the end of this presentation. I hope it was, uh, I hope it was informative. Um, and uh, again, uh, you can get in touch with me directly on Twitter. This is my Twitter account. I also have a, a blog on Medium, probably for the more inclined people out there. But that's also a way to, uh, to get in touch with me. Um, again, ho I hope this was useful. I hope you learned a few things. Uh, please get in touch if you have questions. 
And uh, thanks for listening. And until next time, uh, have fun experimenting with AWS.